So I think, um, you know, today is a really tense time between U.S. and China with tech and trade wars going on, and, um, and it's impacting the venture capital landscape and the deal-making landscape, uh, particularly China, the U.S. And uh, I would like to ask Henry uh, for uh, an update on what's happening with, uh, the, you know, this regulation out of Washington, D.C., uh, and the Trump, President Trump crackdown on these kind of deals. Like what's going on? Is there, tell us what's happening. Sure, yeah, well, Rebecca, you really put me on the spot. I did. I, I, I think you know, some of the, uh, the, the folks here uh, actually know recently um, uh, the, the U.S. government rejected two deals. Two deals were, were killed. Uh, one is my client. Uh, we've been uh, doing that deal for um, more than a year. Uh, okay. And everything. But um, just to give you a general update, it's, um, it's getting increasingly harder. So, so that's why um, uh, we, we can chat with the deal makers now today. Uh, right. A lot of the, uh, the, the, the VCs now these days are trying to you know, stay away from the U.S. market you know, and then try to focus on elsewhere. Uh, and then uh, for, uh, in terms of you know, if you want to talk about the gist of the, the, the new law, Previously, it was all about, about control. So, so if you if you do not have control, it's okay. You know, even if it's a uh, sensitive business, but now it's really about access, access to uh, uh, non-public material technical information. Essentially, you can have no control and still have access to you know, certain information, and then and then that scope just is a lot larger, and, and that really you no know, put you know, today's deal makers you know, in a in a very you no know, hard position because um, the U.S. is still the center of innovation and everything. I'm sure you no know, William. On the UN, David, you, know, you you all want to do U.S. deals, but uh, yeah, it's it's getting harder. You know, and and you know, one way to get around it is to have zero control, zero access, and still try to do the deal. But but that's that's just hard. So let's put it that way. Um, the the new U.S. law is making things harder. But um, I think for our deal makers, you know, today we'll chat about then. You no, know, if if not U.S., you no, know, where where should we go? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely I'm seeing uh, movement towards Southeast Asia and uh, also Israel. Um, for, for, for this one, I'll help you now, Rebecca. I'll, I'll co-moderate a little bit. I'll, I'll sure. give the question to, um, to, to David. Because sure. um, I think David is focusing on elsewhere and not looking at different business. And just, just wanted to you know, hear David's thoughts on, or, or for instance, you know, where are you focusing right now? You know, where? Um, so you talk about this, uh, it just happened this morning, I had a conversation with our lawyer um, briefing me about the new surface requirement. Um, we uh, happen to be an investor, early stage investor in a company called Pony, for example. Um, uh, although the company is uh, domiciled uh, offshore in Cayman Island, however, they had a very significant R&D research uh, facility in Silicon Valley. Uh, as a result, uh, all the investors now are required to do disclosure. Um, so we have to uh, disclose um, our investor, uh, <coughs> our LPs. Um, this is a new requirement. So I'm waiting to see all the paperwork coming uh, from our lawyers to see how much more extra work we have to do. Uh, uh, this is not just us. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the, uh, even though we are uh, you know, focusing on China, uh, I think a lot of uh, you know, Silicon Valley-based VCs are, uh, are going to be hit with uh, additional uh, disclosure requirements. Um, but this is just uh, the nature of our business. Yeah. Um, for us, we are um, in a rep on China, so we hear our fund is dedicated to look at uh, China-specific opportunities, uh, either uh, we, we are defined a little bit more broadly. So either um, uh, originated from China or um, have a significant opportunity uh, looking at China. So Tony was the example that started in Silicon Valley, but uh, majority of its, uh, its market focus is now in China. Uh, it, uh, it is now ranked one of the top three or top four autonomous uh, uh, driving companies globally. Uh, and definitely number one in China. Uh, they provide, uh, you know, level four plus uh, autonomous uh, solutions uh, for uh, vehicles. So um, we are, uh, again, coming back to Repo in China, we are about half of our, uh, our investments uh, are now focused in consumer. Uh, since we think, um, you know, you look at the China, the GDP is at 
really a very significant level. And more importantly, China contributes about 30% overall global GDP growth. Uh, uh, so when you look at uh, this large economy and it's growing uh, rapidly, you have to look at its consumer base. Uh, we think, you know, when I first came to China in 2005, the GDP per capita was 1,200 US dollars, and today it's you know, close to 9,000 uh, US dollars. So, uh, and about 2,500 US dollars disposable income. Uh, and that larger consumer base, and again, that number is for 1.3 billion, right? So for tier one, tier two city, the numbers are much, much higher. And, and, and one of the theme we're looking at right now is um, the emerging uh, new consumer, new group of consumers in lower tier cities. Uh, these are you know, tier three, tier four, tier five cities. Um, they account for about 60% of the population, 1.3 billion, and uh, about 40% of the GDP. Uh, and, but, but the growth rate in those lower tier cities are much faster than tier one, tier two city now, uh, because the tier, two, tier, uh, tier one, tier two cities are approaching a saturation and growing slowly. And so there are a couple examples, like you know, someone mentioned the Ping Dodo, uh, was an example, and you know my company, Treat Hotel, uh, is another example that's focusing in this emerging uh, consumer group. That many of them are for the first time embracing smartphone and mobile internet services. So we're really witnessing kind of the second wave of growth uh, in in you know mobile internet uh, in the last few years. So that's one. Oh, that's great, and, and your perspective on that too, in terms of the kinds of new ideas that you're seeing coming up, and, and the kinds of sectors that you're investing in today that you think are particularly innovative, that China is setting the standard. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so I'm, I'm with Jim Fun. So we are a Beijing-based energy investment firm, founded back in uh, 2006. That was our background, and uh, we are like, we were really early in stage, um, that small check size uh, and moving fast. So um, we, we, we identify ourselves as a founder-centric investment firm so that we don't, we, we, we don't, uh, because we're so early, we just try to identify the talent who would be uh, ideal entrepreneurs, uh, whatever they do. Um, so we want to invest in people uh, who we really invest in whatever they do. That's the ideal kind of profile. So we don't try to um, predict uh, and guess what sectors will be, say, uh, more heavy on uh, in terms of a portfolio weight. Um, so, we, we, which means that we we, we can't we, we don't have a very good, good uh, indication of uh, of the future sectors we're we're looking heavily at. Um, however, uh, we we do observe as an early investor in the market uh, what uh, sort of cluster the entrepreneurs are in. like basically what what are people doing like when entrepreneurs come to us. So we get about two hundred BPs, more than two hundred uh, BPs every day, and uh, we can kind of get a get a read as almost like an index on what we are doing and uh, um, and also. Uh, basically, trying to um, uh, figure out wh wh where the future will be, and um, uh, I think I think we're looking at very, very similar stuff, and uh, uh, maybe similar to other VCs as well. Everyone's looking at what we call lower tier cities, and um, the, the, yeah, there's an even more condescending jargon to it. The people call it the sinking population. Um, uh, uh, it's, uh, and honestly, I've never been to what we call a fifth tier city my, my, myself, but um, but as a, I mean, just factually, we we are. Looking at, um, at the underserved population, uh, in which the the first uh, two generation of internet consumer internet products um, do not serve very well, uh, either in e-commerce, content, games, or whatever, and also um, uh, other than uh, the when we, uh, the lower tier cities in China, we're also looking at uh, like Chinese entrepreneurs going overseas um, to uh, markets like uh, Southeast Asia, which is now actually quite crowded with the Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, as well as uh, say uh, like even the home base in the U.S. Um, and uh, and even exotic places like Africa. So um, uh, uh, like Chinese Chinese entrepreneurs are going everywhere now. Like Chinese restaurants, that's what we're seeing. Um, so that's actually kind of a of the theme that we observe. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Definitely, this China, the Southeast Asia trend is a hot one. Uh, William, I know uh, you've also spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia. You have a, have a number of portfolio companies in Southeast Asia, so could you talk about the China Southeast Asia dynamic? Sure. So um, we focus on cross border at China Accelerator and Mox. Uh, we run these two accelerator programs where we invest. Uh, we help these companies, mostly from all over the world, including China, uh, enter Asia and go cross border within Asia. Uh, so it's very difficult for most VCs to be global uh, because the people who give us our money. 
uh, don't want us to be global. They want us to be focused on a particular geography or a particular sector. Um, so we're a little weird because our founder uh, seeded our fund, and most of the, you know, for the most of our history, our founder Sean, um, uh, we basically were just investing his money. Uh, so we were allowed to do things a little bit differently. So if you look at, uh, say, India and mobile internet, um, you know, it is taking off. It's sort of like the four or five, six tier cities in, in China. Well, inter uh, India is like a giant uh, four, five, six tier, tier city, and the internet is really uh, taking off. Um, before, only rich people could use data, but two years ago, um, you could get basically unlimited mobile phone data for $5, not for one month, but for three months. Uh, and that's really changed the market. So 2016, um, you had maybe uh, almost no Chinese apps in India. Uh, out of the top 100, just a handful. Uh, 2017, uh, 17 of the top 100 apps in India were Chinese. Uh, and as of last year, 47 of the top 100 apps in India are Chinese. Uh, so we've done 10 investments in India in the last uh, year. Uh, and we're powering, you know, we've got one app in Xiaomi, India. Uh, we're working on our second one. Uh, so think about the, the Xiaomi model here. Uh, some of that is actually happening in India and Southeast Asia. Um, but uh, whereas Xiaomi understands the Chinese market pretty well, uh, they're building a lot of the apps themselves. Uh, in other markets, uh, we're positioning uh, our startups to fill that role. Uh, so, uh, for example, we're powering uh, Xiaomi Video uh, in India, which is a, uh, they're the number one phone brand in India uh, and a pretty big player there. Yeah, well, that's part of the success story is the India uh, success for Xiaomi. Uh, so, at least internationally. Um, so, of the Southeast Asian markets, which one or which one are you most keen on? I mean, yeah, you just basically go size. So there's so India, and India. then there's Indonesia, and then, uh, and then we'll get to the other ones eventually. Uh, okay. So uh, we, we do a fair <laughs> bit. I mean, um, so uh, we've got a couple companies in, in Malaysia, a couple companies in the Philippines, uh, a couple companies in Thailand. Like we invest in, um, I invest in about 40, 40 companies per year. Uh, so a quite different model. Uh, and uh, so um, we can uh, spread a bit. Uh, but yeah. India by far, uh, then Indonesia. Uh, in terms of internet population, you're talking, um, what is it, four or five, four or five hundred million? I think in the other, uh, Indonesia is, uh, it's a little hard to keep track, but maybe 140 million smartphone users, something like that. It keeps on growing. Very uh, dynamic market. Do, do you guys now set up your office in India, or do, do, do you do it across Southeast Asia, do you all of things for? for uh, neither. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Singapore is a very nice place to live. If you're a VC, you can hang out there, and uh, they got good air conditioning. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we we actually set up in, in Taiwan. Um, oh, that that's very unique. That, that's uh, very unique. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I need to say this uh, very diplomatically. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah. dollar per dollar, mm -hmm. Taiwan's got the most productive engineering and programming talent in all of Asia. Wow. Um, yes, so we have companies from all around the world setting up uh, um, um, uh, basically their programming teams there. Uh, and again, it's dollar per dollar. Um, you know, it's like half the price of Singapore, um, Vietnam, much better, uh, even India. Right. Wow, Taiwan. Um, so why don't each one of you talk about one of your more interesting deals uh, that you've recently done and why it was interesting. Um, so, um, so as I mentioned, uh, half of our investment uh, is in consumer, and the other half is in kind of combination of enterprise and frontier tech. So, um, we actually one of the early firms that focuses on enterprise actually uh, in China uh, since late 2000, 2009, 2008. Uh, we really see you know a rapid growth in enterprise IT services. Um, you know, before it's really difficult to build a enterprise software company in China. Um, you know, customer doesn't want to pay. You sell one copy, and you've already sold the whole country. Um, today, you know, things are changing rapidly uh, within enterprise IT services, largely driven by a couple of things. We felt, um, you know, a, rapid ri a very rapid rise of um, labor costs. Uh, enterprise are facing that. 
uh, day in day out. And before, when labor costs were really cheap, you know, managers can always see more bodies to address it. So today, uh, labor costs and costs associated with labor, uh, you know, social benefits and profits, are uh, probably the single biggest cost item uh, for any enterprise. So today, enterprise customers are really looking at using technology, in particular IT technology, to to uh, to improve efficiency and lower the cost. Um, the second is, I think, uh, before, you know, as I said, you know, enterprise customers doesn't want to pay, you know, premium, doesn't want to pay anything for software. They rather, you know, pay money to buy boxes uh, of equipment. Today, I think, you know, enterprise customer gradually uh, come to the conclusion that in order to get the latest technology, particularly in big data, in AI, they have to pay, and they are gradually start to accept the new. New uh, uh, business models such as pay for service, subscription, and SaaS, uh, which are already being you know proven models in the U.S. And the third is that we see a large influx of returning entrepreneurs starting company in the area of enterprise, uh, much more so than in you know, uh, for a number of reasons. So we are you know very deep into enterprise. We're in SaaS, in uh, cloud infrastructure, in network security, in uh, big data. Analytics. Uh, the other part, interesting part, is in frontier technology. So uh, again, we are very big in uh, mobility, in autonomous driving, in, and also in uh, uh, application of wide application of AI technology. So, what's your most exciting okay. frontier tech Sorry. company? Um, so, so recently we did a couple of things. We kind of did a couple of moonshot, you know, deals. Uh, one thing is. Um, uh, you know, talk about mobility. Uh, we had we kind of uh, took a little bit different thinking than the likes of Neo and Shaotan. Uh, you know, having you know Redpoint was the firm that incubated Android operating systems. Um, so you know, Andy Rubin, you know, we supported him and incubated. So we our thinking is kind of we take the smartphone idea for uh, smart vehicle. Uh, you know, uh, so today you have. You know, 86, 87 percent of the smartphones uh, are powered by Android operating system, and then Apple has another, you know, 14, 15 percent. So we think that you know, Tesla, maybe Neo, maybe Xiaopeng could be, you know, the iPhone for, for EV or for smart vehicle. But maybe there's an opportunity for Android play for smart EV. So, uh, you know, we've been looking at that opportunity. We found a great you know, high caliber team uh, that's building the software layer, the intelligence uh, for smart EV, and 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 trying to provide that to um, the, the not only the EV manufacturer but also uh, traditional uh, manufacturer. Because today in China you're you're shipping 25, 26 million vehicle, and they're only one one million to 1.5 million are uh, you know by the the so-called next generation of uh, EV uh, guys like the Neo, like Shopin. So there are, you know, 95% of the cars are still made by, you know, traditional manufacturers who have very little expertise in how to build a EV or how to build a connected vehicle, how to build a smart vehicle. So we are taking kind of the intelligent smartness um, to the software and then building a a kind of operating system and, and providing to providing them to uh, traditional manufacturers. So it's a it's a very audacious uh, mission, but it could be we, we think it could be very very good. Okay. Good. You want another one? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing a great job. Uh, Yuan, tell us tell us about one of your hot new exciting deals and uh, why. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'll try a different one from the one I talked about in Hong Kong then. Um, yeah. I, I can talk about CastBox, which is you should mention yeah, the company. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a Chinese uh, Chinese team, uh, previously from Google, developing a mobile product for uh, audio audio content aggregation. The uh, company started uh, in, in 2016, so we invested a little bit a little bit more than two years ago as the, as the first check-in, uh, when there was like just uh, three co-founders, and there was not even a product. And uh, within two years' time, they Got about 20 million um, uh, users, more than 20, uh, almost 30 million users now worldwide, 
Um, and we never, we never, we rarely talk about this company in any forums because the, usually the the, ten, the audience is mostly Chinese, and none of the Chinese have ever heard of the company because they, they have zero Chinese users. Uh, they, they, it's not on the shelf in China. Well, maybe some user on, on VPN, but no users in China basically. And uh, among the, the the very active and engaged uh, audience, about a third is in the U.S., a third in Japan and Korea, and a third in uh, in Europe. So, so um, Silicon Dragon started its podcast. So on. Oh, Fox. oh, really? I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Because feel free to subscribe and be an active user. Uh, you have yeah. to use VPN in China, though. Yeah, um, so my, my first episode was with the founder of CastBox. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, really, I really didn't know that. Yeah, she's very... That's why that's the only company you mentioned. Among yeah, the, well, <laughs> okay. yeah, okay. Yeah, I was like, oh, I have other good companies that she never talked about. Um, and uh, um, so I, I think, well, for me personally, that was the first time we, we invest in a local Chinese uh, company based uh, in China and uh, with the office and the entire crew in China uh, with wild success uh, worldwide. Well, I, and David did a great company, Apis, right? That was also like foreign users, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, um, crazy about the product uh, in, in other countries. But um, I think Casco is exciting, not only because it's a Chinese team going abroad, but also because it's doing audio, which I think is the next generation, not next generation, but a, a very good uh, uh, complementary alternative to video in the video, uh, the video market, which is very uh, crowded. Um, and it's a, it's a more passive uh, setting than video, so everybody fully engaged when consuming video content, but in audio is more in a more passive situation. So, so I think it could be gigantic uh, as a sector uh, that is um, not, as, uh, not as competitive yet. Um, yeah. So and that's also uh, like a, I think mobile tools is among the first wave in which Chinese entrepreneurs turn out to be very competitive globally. Um, last time I used the, the phrase it's like a Spanish armada going overseas. Um, I think going going forward maybe there will be more uh, there will be more challenging tasks for Chinese entrepreneurs um, uh, to try uh, other markets maybe like uh, 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 say businesses with a more ha with a heavier offline component. Or, or more culturally, uh, or need more cultural cu cultivation, such, such if you're creating content uh, to target foreign users, right? That'll be that'll be challenging for Chinese entrepreneurs going forward, right? But I think say games and mobile tools uh, and mobile products, that, that, that's like um, um, some somewhat like low hanging fruit for Chinese entrepreneurs for now. So I think Castle is, is a good example in, in that way. Okay, good. Uh, William, can we put you on the spot with this question? Yeah, sure. So. Um, you know, coffee is very, very, uh, um, you know, exciting now. Luck, good luck in coffee. Uh, the consumer upgrade story, everybody's drinking more and more of this stuff. Um, but most people don't actually know how the Chinese coffee market is structured in terms of the beans. And it's basically two or three, maybe four very large companies who buy coffee from offshore. They pay up front, and then they bring it in. And then it's mostly crap. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, uh and uh, one of the, 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 the funny thing about this industry is it's extremely uh, fragmented. Um, so um, uh, if you dig into it, you find out that uh, the farmers, you know, they, they're, they're, they're getting very little money for the coffee. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you, know, um, you know, a couple bucks a kilo. Uh, and the people here in China, uh, the roasters, are, are paying close to like $25, $30 a kilo. Uh, and there's eight, Set on average, eight middlemen in the middle. Uh, so um, you know, because we're we're kind of cross border, it's very it's somewhat difficult uh, for Chinese companies to innovate in this area uh, because all the foreign sellers um, spent the last year kind of getting ripped off uh, by Chinese buyers. Uh, bad experiences for whatever reason. Uh, so um, Coffee Exchange set up a, an exchange for coffee. Yeah, very creative name, Lewis. Uh, and uh, so the farmers are getting twice the money. The roasters here in China are paying 30% less, um, and uh, Coffee Exchange makes a nice prof profit in the middle. Uh, and so uh, you know, this is a type of company where it's solving a problem, uh, track, trace, uh, but also you know it's basically win, 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 except for the seven, eight middlemen in the middle. So is this where Luck and Coffee is getting its beans? Um, hopefully. Not oh, yet. Okay. Not quite yet. So no, I mean, it's a, it's a startup, early stage. Yeah. They were in the last batch of China Accelerator. Uh, three, four months after launch, they're break even uh, and uh, unfunded. So feel free to invest. So who, who's going to win this battle, Starbucks or Luckin? Um, I have no idea. What does the uh, audience think? Starbucks or Luckin? I don't actually Luckin? drink coffee. <laughs> oh, I do, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't tried Luckin. Two different models. Okay.
Okay. And I actually think today that there's no, um, well, no, uh, among the audience, no, no one investing in um, Latin coffee, if I remember correctly. And then they, they were smiling, I think. So I think that. It <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't touch, they didn't touch that. It's two different uh, models. Wine's burning cash. Yeah, so what? what <laughs> you you so have to be careful. You're, you're getting recorded. <laughs> so, you said no, no one's an investor. I was thinking about it, but I didn't dare to say it. <laughs> then you said no one's investing. I was like, oh, I can say it now. No, s seriously, if you look at you know, like everybody here and Rebecca, you, you get you no know, really good you know, audience and participants, but you know, there's no investor in Latin coffee. But there are a lot Maybe of we're not smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> smart enough. Well, what, what about, we, I mean, we all should invest in coffee exchange. Um, so what about the bike pairing model? I mean, uh, what's the future for that? I, I don't think anyone here invested in any OPPO or Mobike or you So we, we, uh, we invested in a, a company called Social Bicycle, which did bike sharing in New York in 2010. Um, and no, nobody really cared about it. Uh, we invested, we, had, we invested actually three times uh, and nobody else cared about it oh, no until finally OPPO and Mobike came out. And only after you know, China led the charge could we finally get a Series A nine years after the company started? <laughs> yeah. um, and we're very happy because uh, seven months after the Series A, uh, we dumped it to Uber. Uh, oh, so uh, right. we, yeah, we sold it to them for two hundred million. It's called Jump Bikes. Yeah, Jump Bikes. Uh, and we own twenty percent because we invested four times. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Let's talk about OFO. So, so we are the pre-A investor uh, in, in OFO. Um, we live a story in space, not not in the. Um, not, not on the roads of the open communities yet, um, and that was very that, that was again the founder a founder centric approach. The guy, um, although very young, uh, was was already was already very entrepreneurial in college. But Ofo was basically his first job. Uh, creating Ofo was his first job out of out of school. Um, so he was also the president of the student uh, student association in in Peking University. And and just for the record, historically, uh, the guys at this position usually take on positions like the president of China or premier of China. Uh, in 50, uh, 30 years time, so uh, we we think um, it, uh, he he has to go through a uh, very rigorous competition to to attain that position. That that also demonstrates leadership. So uh, when a guy like that, instead of pursuing uh, a career in, within the government, decided to do a startup, uh, we just uh, backed him without hesitation and without without knowing that it will be um, that big, honestly. Um, um, and uh, and uh, and so the company has its ups and downs, and, uh, and uh, as everyone knows, um, it's uh, it, 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 it is struggling now to um, repay the uh, uh, the deposits. Uh, but uh, you know, we 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 had the discussions uh, multiple times within our office. We never thought it was a wrong decision to invest. And uh, uh, there there are all all those uh, twists of fate and uh, uh, like the the deus ex machina moments um, uh, for between the competition of uh, mobile and OVO. I think for both companies. You know, they would have they, they would be expecting a better outcome than what they have now uh, and the competition in China was just so was just so fierce um, uh, there was a US investor coming to China uh, in, I think in 2017 and, and he was like well in the US no one copies the mo maybe you have two competitors within three months time and in China maybe you have two weeks and then you have like 12 competitors or, or not, not if not more um, there was a point there was a point you, you see like rainbows of uh, bicycles on, on the streets like yellow ones purple ones and you know, uh, and or, or whatever color you have, um, and uh, the the two ones became um, some open mobile were the largest, and later Hello Bike was was big. Um, so again, uh, they, they, like they hope for a better ending, and it was unfortunate that um, um, they they're not uh, uh, they, they they're not where they want to be. Um, but uh, uh, we invested. It, it was a very simple. It was a very simple thesis, and I think the competition in China uh, really kind of um, I think it ruined many business models, which were supposed to be more effective. Um, or maybe you can put it another way: the, the market is so effective in China, so that once you find a very uh, lucrative business model with very great profit margin, you have copycats very soon. So that your margin will be squeezed. Like Jeff Bezos said, your margin is my business. Uh, so that is definitely true in China. So it's very hard to maintain um, uh, a high margin without if, if the product does not have, have a very high barrier to entry. So you, you, you for, for for that, I actually, I uh, have a question for you. So. So you guys were enjoying the ride, saw the value in, uh, in OFO no, went up. Um, and during all those discussions about the mar market when you saw the competition, uh, was there any discussion on um, FGN fund, no, should, should you not sell the secondary shares, no, find a way to dump it somewhere else in the process? Because you had time. I'm just curious. 
like whether that discussion happened and uh, and no, what what was the outcome of that of discussion? Selling? Well, being being very early, uh, being very early investors. Well, well, first it's not my deal; it's my colleague's deal. Uh, uh, like my colleague, uh, no, no, I'm saying I know I don't take I don't take uh, I don't take the credit because we view that we don't view that as a failure; we view that as a success of being identifying a a a, a big company or or at least a formerly big company in very early in infant stage. So I I, I I say that not to you know avoid any I, I say that to not to you know um, take anyone's credit. Um, so we we had the discussion. Um, uh, internally uh, uh, about about exit, but not not in the bad times, but in the in the in the good times, right? And uh, um, it was just um, uh, it's 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 it, it, it's actually quite tricky uh, because the, the the competition is so intense between the two, and any 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 behavior could be uh, misinterpreted as a, like say as a, as a signal for uh, as a, 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 there is a signal risk, right? Although at that time we thought it's going to be really really great. Um, it's just that the, the valuation in the entire market is so is so rich. Um, so uh, although we're very optimistic, uh, we, we we discussed that, but um, but, uh, but no one is selling, and there was not really like a trading window. So um, that was not really um, that was not really um, an, an option at that time, to be honest. Um, and uh, um, and what, so what what was the are, are you pivot is Ofo pivoting to an e-commerce model now using those consumer deposits? Oh, they're, to they're, they're trying to uh, they try very hard to, to hold on and to pay off all the uh, to, to honor all the obligations. Uh, so that they're uh, they're importing um, yeah like like you said the, the merchandise is to uh, compensate for the users who uh, who are uh, you know who, who have their deposits still with the company not not returned yet. And I think they're still trying right. So yesterday I read a report that they moved. So there was a user who was uh, 150,000 something in ranking, and then he moved like 5,000 ahead. So that which means that they paid paid off more 5,000 more users. So they're 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 holding on there uh, right now with whatever methods they can. With e-commerce um, as part of it. Um, so what is a deal that you wish you would have done? Uh, okay, David. <laughs> so. Um, Deal. Oh, so, for example, I, I think you know, being in the market long enough, I mean, the benefits that you 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 know you see a lot of deals, and uh, I think we looked at it, you know, honestly early on, um, we looked at uh, Olama, and that was because you know Webpoint was a early investor in a company called Just Eat, uh, and that was you know a European based kind of food delivery business and became very successful, you know, when IPO uh, and I think it has a market cap of you know, four or five billion dollars. And so so we you know I was you know approached by you know this founder of Erlama when he was you know just finished his uh, university. Uh, he started the company actually in the dorm and and he came to us and he said wanna do a Jesse for China. I think I think uh, you know we like the idea. Uh, we just couldn't get comfortable around you know the founder, entrepreneur, and, and it turned out that you know I think our thinking was still correct because we 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 really believe the market in China, particularly particularly the consumer market in China, is fierce enough. Just like Yuan just mentioned, um, you have to assume you know uh, you're gonna have dozens of uh, competitors uh, in this business. Uh, you know, and how you're gonna build entry barriers, whether it's capital, whether it's execution, whatever. And that's why we always, you know, try to back repeat entrepreneur or entrepreneur who have, you know, putting their time uh, in a large platform company. Sure. Um, so, so that's something that I, I think. Uh, that's the one deal you wish you would have done. Well, in and, hindsight, but, but, but I mean, that's the one deal that we missed. Yeah. Um, okay. Honestly speaking, that he was probably the only college, you know, entrepreneur that you know went successful in the last fifteen years, uh, who started a company either during college or right after college and became successful in the last you know fifteen twenty years. Yeah. Uh, what about you? What's the deal you wish you would have done? Uh, well. So, so, so we are relatively um, uh, young uh, uh, and entering this room. Although our founder is very, very senior, he's in his sixties. Uh, he founded New Oriental, but uh, we as a firm was only founded in uh, in late uh, twenty twelve. 
uh, another time we were really small test. Now we were check between say one to two, uh, one to two million dollars. By that time we did like say two hundred k through the checks. So there are many deals that we wish that could be in our portfolio, such as ByteDance, PD, PDD, Elma. Uh, for those guys, um, they never raised say like a, a half a million sort of angel stake, right? So when PDD came out, the first check was eight million dollars. So the founder would never even bother talking to us uh, at the time. So I wish we have a great story like David, uh, you know, so that we met this guy and now we're thinking about this and then we decided to. Yeah, but so most of most of the time we're we're meeting with uh, uh, with, uh, with with like really young founders who are asking for solo, and uh, so so I think the odds of of them compared to very seasoned entrepreneurs, independent entrepreneurs, uh, is lower. Um, and uh, yeah, there are many deals that we wish we did. Um, well, we at least we have we wish we have the chance to see, but at that time we, we did not. Um, so, but 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 basically. Um, the story, the rise of the story of PDD uh, really gave us a stimulant so that we, we are shifting our focus of attention uh, to a different, uh, um, uh, uh, not to a different, but to complement our original attention with a new focus on repeat entrepreneurs and, and product or, or, or uh, uh, say industry veterans who are say executives at tech firms and leaving to start their own, own, um, own companies, which was not a focus for us before. Previously, we were focused on uh, say senior attorneys and more like younger entrepreneurs. Uh, so PDD was a similar. So we realized, uh, okay, so those sort of guys who are coming out to ask for more money, uh, but who did more in the past are more likely to succeed. So we, we are now, now meeting more of such uh, such folks. And did that also inspire you? Or oh, here? Oh, the eight step. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, well, not 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 to not execute it. on the strategy, but there was one deal. Um, which was a direct result of our uh, uh, such of such thought. So we invested in a deal called a V8, um, and I guess no one has heard of the company. Um, it says if, if you don't speak Chinese, you definitely have not heard of the company. And if you speak Chinese with a uh, with Mandarin with without any dialect, you probably have not heard of the company. Um, so uh, this is a short this is a short video company um, that was created by uh, one of the senior VPs at ByteDance who was responsible for creating two of the five largest short video platforms in, in, in China. And he left ByteDance to start his own company for the first backer. Uh, and within one year's time, so we backed the company in the angel stage when there was no product, just two people uh, in, in, I think, February last year. Um, and, uh, uh, and now it has about uh, 20 million users. Um, uh, in, in China, mostly in in, for, uh, in lower tier cities like like third to fourth tier cities, so the, the content is very is very differentiated from that of TikTok or even that of uh, uh, of Quaisha. Okay, William. Um, so we do 150 to 170 new investments a year. Uh, so as long as they're willing to, to work with us, uh, we basically invest in uh, a lot of companies. Uh, so, uh, uh, but um, uh, there's one story. So. Um, I used to do a, a lot of angel. I'm not allowed to anymore. Uh, but uh, I angel invested in this company um, called ECD Sky. Uh, and it was a platform for games, made a lot of mistakes. Um, but the entrepreneur worked really, really, really hard to try and get the angel investors their money back. And uh, actually, he ended up uh, selling his company in an aqua hire or aqua sale um, to, uh, to another company. And he got he actually worked, he got most of uh, our money back for us, and then he took stock uh, in that company. Uh, now the problem is that he was based in Beijing, and this company is in Guangzhou. So he had a newborn, but he had to work and he had to commute to Guangzhou for two years uh, in order to uh, to do this. But he did it in order to you know safeguard the investors. Uh, so I said you know at that time if you ever do another startup, um, you know just give me a call I'll invest. Um, and uh, now the problem is when he uh, he did uh, he. He, what his problem was that he couldn't see his family, right? He, he was in Guangzhou. He had a newborn baby here in Beijing, um, so he uh, built a solution um, called a uh, Xiaoyu Zaijia. Uh, so that's a it's a little robot that allows you to uh, see your family. Uh, you can kind of log in and, and have breakfast with them and, and, and check them out. Um, and it's an AI assistant now. I think they used to be partnered with Baidu. I think they just closed with Series C or something. Um, and uh, so I wish I invested. The problem was I was in between funds. Uh, and I didn't have any money, uh, so. Uh, um, but uh, that's one where you know the, the entrepreneur um, was uh, very, and he actually did call me. They never did an angel round; they went straight to A, five million A. Uh, but he did call me and said, uh, "You know, you want to invest?" And unfortunately, I couldn't. It's a good story. Um, okay, Henry. Uh, any last words? Because we do have to wrap it up now because we're, we, we've actually run over time. 
So yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit of no, advertising really in there <laughs> for, oh. for 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 Kuli. No? No? No. Like, no. Uh, what what is the what is the deal, what is the deal you wish you would have done? Well, the, the, the deal no we we as lawyers are, as law firms no we wish we you know, uh, uh, had done is really you no know, for to, to to back up you know, really the same thing you no know, as you guys you no know, back up you no know, the the founders you no know, and the companies at a very you know, uh, early stage. Because if you look at you know, the, the law firm's business model, you know, um, especially for you know, the early investment stage, we actually did not make a lot of money from 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 David from Yan from the from the the, the kind of you no know, early stage. But uh, if you back out you know, back you know, the, uh, the the unicorns, you, know, you grow with them, bring them to uh, to IPO, uh, you know, do the later stage sophisticated deals, and then hopefully you not know, doing even going private transactions, which you know, I, I do some of the largest you know, in China, that would be a uh, good business. So, so if you ask, you no, know, as you no, know, as law firms, you no, know, as the, the the participants, you know, in the ecosystem, we we also you know, want to be you no know, with the winners, the, the market movers and shakers who really you know yeah. build business. So you got to hang out all the time with these guys. Oh, absolutely. And so we, we we follow them and just just you know, uh, follow their investments and hopefully you know, their investments will, will do well for them. Right. And Sky then we turn to the company side. Skyrocket, right? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's give uh, our panelists a round of applause. And uh, let's let's also pause for a photo. So uh, you guys can maybe give me a five second rule. We'll come and take one more picture together. One picture. Stay where you are for one second. One picture here first. Maybe the picture. Or one picture. Or for all these picture. Do you mind it? Move it. Do you mind it? Go over there, please. Move your picture from this angle. Come here. Okay. All right. All right.